This is the day the Lord has made. Come on, let's rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Dr. D.Z. Cofield, senior pastor here at the Good Hope Missionary Baptist Church, and I want to thank you this morning for the privilege of your time. Thank you for being with us, allowing us into your personal space to encourage your heart, to inspire your spirit, to really equip you to be all that God wants you to be. Now listen, if you've been blessed by our worship services, please like or share them with a family member or friend and let them know there's never been a better time for hope. In the midst of everything that's going on around us, now over 206,000 people who have died as a result of COVID-19, with the racial injustice going on, election season is upon us. But in the midst of it all, please don't forget God is still on the throne. Let's go to the Word of God and hear what God has to say to us this morning. We're going to be reading from the 100th Division of Psalms. The 100th Division of Psalms, the New King James translation reads, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. Come on, everybody say that. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures for all generations. Let's go to God in prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Father, thank you for today. We pray now that all that we do and say this day would be pleasing in your sight. As we celebrate this Lord's Supper together, as we celebrate the gift of life that you have given to us, God, may all that we do today glorify you so that somebody who needs you might know and see that you are a God who is worthy to be praised. Bless us, God, that your people may be edified, that they may be encouraged. And God, as a byproduct, may the devil be horrified and terrified by what you will do through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to take this opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And as I am speaking, I want you to gather your elements if you have not already. Uh, if you have your prepackaged communion, because you picked that up, get that out right now as we celebrate this meal of the ages. Uh, the Bible says it was the night that Jesus was to be portrayed. Uh, as he began to speak to the 12, uh, one who had ill intent in his heart, Judas, left. And when Judas left, Jesus took the common elements of the Passover meal and gave them uncommon and supernatural significance. In terms of their symbolism and what they would represent for those of us who would become Christ's followers. He said, take this unleavened bread. This represents my body, which is to be given for you. And as often as you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. I think it's pretty clear by the reaction of the disciples, they still didn't understand that Jesus came not to be the reigning monarch king, but to become a suffering servant and the substitute paying the price on Calvary for our sins. Then he went to the fruit of the vine and he said, this represents my blood, the new covenant. The writer of Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. And Jesus says, drink this. And as we eat and drink, we commune with those saints down through the ages who communed around this table. Let's pray and ask God's blessings on these elements as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Father, thank you for today. 
Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate around this communion table, around these elements. Uh, we pray, God, and ask your blessings upon the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. We pray that it will be sanctified and that it will nourish our spirit man to continue to run on to see what the end will be. God, forgive us of our sins. Let nothing that we have thought, done, or said hinder our worship of you around this table and our fellowship with you day by day. We ask your blessings now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein, and sinners who plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilt and lose all their stain. Come on, sing it with us. There is a fountain. Betrayed. He took the bread, the unleavened bread. He blessed it and broke it, gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Let us eat and remember together. Likewise, when supper was ended, he took the cup, the fruit of the vine, and after he blessed it, he poured it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take drink. This is my blood. This is the new covenant. The writer of Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sins. The blood of our Lord and Savior would not cover our sins, but would wash us white as snow. Let us drink and remember together. Let us pray. God, may our worship around this table be acceptable in your sight. And may we be better witnesses and servants for you until we come together again around this table. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God be with you. Now, we have been honoring our seniors uh, throughout the month of August, and we've carried it over into September, and we've got more seniors to honor, so we're going to keep it going on this first Sunday in October. Uh, I want to give a special shout out uh, to my friend, to my brother, to a man that has been such a blessing to me, he and his wife, uh, Deacon Rudolph and Annie Wilson. Uh, Deacon Wilson was the brother that took me out to uh, learn how to play golf. 
uh, when I first got to the Good Oak Church, I had never picked up golf clubs, and he took me out to Tom Bass Park. And I got to tell you something about Rudolph Wilson. If you've ever been around him, one of the gifts that God has deposited within him is the gift of encouragement. Man, that brother has such an encouraging gift, and he would encourage me. I look back now. I mean, I didn't do anything half the time but dribble the ball forward. And he would say things like, that's all right. You got it going in the right direction. And uh, so I want to thank God for Deacon Rudolph and Annie Wilson. We want to thank God for Pearl Simpson. Uh, we affectionately call her Mom Pearl. She mans the bookstore and uh, makes sure that everything is taken care of there. So Mom Pearl, we, we certainly want to give you a shout out on today. Sister Doris Flake, oh my God. Man, listen, if you want to see a child of God that do love Jesus, who's going to praise, who's going to give her shout, it doesn't matter what she's going through. She's going to give God the glory in the midst of it all. It's none other than that person who has a unique servant's heart, and that's Sister Doris Flake. We want to thank God for Sister Leola Jones. Her volunteering in the food pantry is part of what makes this church what it is and the opportunity that God has given us to bless others is directly because of her. Lenora Lair, our guest relations ministry, so important because that guest relations ministry has as its goal to make people feel welcome and to make people feel wanted. And Sister Lair does a great job with both. And last but certainly not least, the lead servant of the Handbell Choir, Sister Cheryl Crawford. We want to thank God for her today. She succeeded Brother Alexton Mallory, who was the founder of the Handbell Choir and has been a part of the Handbell Choir for many years and has taken over leadership of that ministry. And I got to tell you, uh, it's such a blessing. When I got here 26 years ago, and I remember looking at all of the ministries that were listed, and I said, a Handbell Choir? I said, man, that's unique. I mean, a grown folk Handbell Choir? And man, what a blessing it is to hear the songs of Zion played on the bells and you just have an opportunity to meditate on those songs as they play them. Thank you, Sister Crawford, for your leadership, for your service here at Good Hope, and for all of the Handbell Choir. Thank you so much. Now, before we go further into praise and worship, listen, it is October the first Sunday. I got to tell you something about today so you don't miss this. October the 4th, 1981, that means 39 years ago, I preached my first sermon at the Morning Star Baptist Church in Fairmont, West Virginia. My dad, uh, Zanus Kofia, was the pastor of the church at the time. Uh, pastor now is Wesley Dobbs. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to all of my people back in Fairmont, West Virginia, I want to thank you for your love and your support for watching on this broadcast uh, as we minister on the virtual platform. But yeah, 39 years ago, I remember the subject. Uh, the subject was you can run, but you can't hide. It was out of the book of Revelation. And uh, I don't know a whole lot of what I said, but I just remember uh, God blessed. And uh, I'm grateful to God for that precious memory. That's my anniversary for the first Sunday in October. But all of the birthday people in the month of October, stand on your feet wherever you are. It's time for the birthday song, all right? Come on, let's go. Well, I'm singing happy. pray you have a happy birthday. I hope and pray you are blessed with many, many more. Come on, the praise team is going to take us to the next level. Let's get ready to give God some praise on this day.
Come on, put your hands together and give God some glory.
Come on, we're going to keep this thing going. Come on, come on. Come on, put your hands together. Somebody shout hallelujah. 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 Come on, one more time out of your spirit. Call the name of Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is our risen Savior. He died for our sins. He died to ransom us and to reconcile us to the Father. And he did that all on a hill called Calvary. Come on, let's sing about that, y'all. Oh, say, oh. How he loves Jesus loves us. Shed he is blood at Calvary. He died just to rise and rise and set me free. Now that's a good place wherever you are just to open your mouth and offer him worship. Come on, let's sing that one more time, everybody. Oh, oh, how, how he really loves us. Shed his precious blood. Die just to rise and set me free. Thank you, Lord. Wounded for all 
our transgressions bruised chastised for our iniquity on the tree and with his stripes we healed healed from all disease thank you jesus so we're singing oh So much that he shed his blood, yes. For me, Jesus died. Just arise and set me free. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Singing, oh, the blood of Jesus. We're singing, oh, 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 the blood that set me free, that set me, set me free, yes. I can hear him now calling to the Father. Saying, Lord, if it would be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. God, it's my desire. My desire to please you, Lord, yeah. So they led him away from home to home, yeah. To be tried and convicted. They spit on him. They mocked him. They scorned him. Whipped him until he was unrecognizable. He suffered and agonized. He squared his head in the locks of his shoulders and then he gave Jesus gave his life for me. Yes he did. And I'm so glad that he bore our sorrows and he carried our griefs and he paid our ransom. He removed all of our guilt but that's not all. No, no. On the third day morning, he got up with all power in his hand. He got up with my healing. He got up with my victory. Yes. Yes. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Thank you, Lord, for Calvary. You gave your life just for my liberty. Yes. Come on, somebody open your mouth and offer him worship now. Somebody worship the Lord. Oh, we thank you for Calvary. Thank you for the blood you shed. Thank you for dying for our sins. You could have called 10,000 angels to stand by your side. Yes, you could. But you decided to die. And you died just to set me free. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yes. God, you were wounded. Wounded for our transgressions. And you were bruised. Yes, you were. You were bruised for our iniquity, yes. Oh, the chastisement of our peace was upon you. And with your stripes, Jesus, thank God we are healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, everybody. Come on, let's go to God in prayer as we prepare for the word of the Lord today. Father, we thank you and we bless you for this day. We pray now that you would bless as your word goes forth. May it find fertile ground in our hearts and minds so that the seed of your word will germinate in our lives and produce good fruit so that we would be more than just hearers of your word that we would be doers as well we love you and we ask these blessings in jesus name amen so i had this urge to cook a family brunch um i can cook i don't cook all the time my wife is is a more than capable cook i enjoy her cooking, but every now and then I like to get in the kitchen and dabble, and she always tells me how good my, my cooking is. So I decided I was going to go all out for this brunch. I mean, I was going to have three, four, five different meats. Um, I had catfish. I fried some shrimp. We had oysters for those who didn't eat pork, and then I had a sausage, and I had bacon, and not that little thin bacon. I had that bacon with the thick rind on it. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, we had eggs, cheese eggs. I was actually making eggs to order. Uh, we had hash brown potatoes. We had biscuits, croissants, and we had grits. Now, I got to tell you, man, I mean, it was off the chain. The breakfast was unbelievable. Everybody was raving about how good the breakfast was. And I want to tell you the one thing that everybody complimented me on. They complimented me on the grits. They were like, oh, my God, the grits were perfect. Man, they were, man, they were great. I mean, they were just right. And I got to tell you, those grits were so good that the folk who put salt and pepper on their grits loved them and the people who put sugar on their grits loved them. You know those were good grits, right, because they could go either way. Well, my wife, after everybody had left, we were cleaning up, and she said to me, she said, man, she said, baby, those grits were so good. She said, how did you make those grits so good? And I looked at her, and I smiled, and I said to her, I followed the directions. And she looked at me, and she knows that's kind of a pet peeve of mine, right, that when you get directions to do anything, if the manufacturer provides directions, follow the directions. I told her, I said, I followed the directions. They gave me how much water to put in based on how many grits I was going to put in. And so I followed the directions and added salt to taste and added a little butter, et cetera. But I followed the directions. Now, somebody may be asking, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, here's what I've learned in life. Many people have great ideas, and even more people have great intentions. But the truth of the matter is, very few people are willing to follow the directions. Yeah, see, most of you in here, if you cook grits or you cook rice, you have the idea to have that as a side dish, and your intention is for it to come out perfect. But for many people, making grits or making rice, it's like hit or miss. And that's because people don't follow the directions. And the same is true when it comes to our walk with God. Many times we have great ideas, we have great intentions, and we want God to bless us. We, we pray for God to bless us. And, and we don't care what anybody says or anybody does. This is what we want. This is what we're looking for. We want God to bless us, but we don't want to follow God's directions. Whether it comes to our relationship with him or our fellowship with him or our relationship with other people, whether it comes to our vertical relationship with him or our horizontal relationship with other people, problems always show up 
when you fail to follow God's instructions. Today, I want to begin a series entitled, Doing It God's Way. Doing It God's Way. Um, I I think it's important in the midst of everything that's going on uh, to, to understand that we still have a choice as to whether we're going to do things God's way or we're going to do things our way or somebody else's way. And so today I want to start this series. We're going to take a little break from the joy campaign. We're going to come back to it, I promise you. But we're going to take a little break now and start this series, Doing It God's Way. And today I want to start the first message in this series. I want to talk to you today from the thought, How to Follow God's Instructions. I want to talk today from the thought, how to follow God's instructions. If you have your Bibles, turn there with us. You can also download the outline on the app or via our website. Our foundational text is 2 Samuel chapter 6. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 is an interesting uh, chapter uh, because it literally lays out the move of King David to take the ark of God from the home of Abinadab and to take it back to Jerusalem to reestablish and reignite Jerusalem as the center of worship for the children of Israel. The Bible says that the ark of God had been captured in a battle with the Philistines. Uh, The ark of God literally represents the very presence of God among his people. And the Bible says in this battle with the Philistines, uh, the Israelites suffered a defeat. About 4,000 men were killed. They went back and they said, you know what the problem is? I'm paraphrasing now. We didn't have the ark of the covenant with us. As a matter of fact, the text says that they said, let's go back and get the Ark of the Covenant. And when we bring the Ark of God with us, the Ark, here's what the text says, it will save us. They put more emphasis on the Ark than they did on the God who was represented by the Ark. And the Bible says when the ark of God came into the Israelite camp, when they had gone and retrieved it from Shiloh under the watchful eye of the high priest Eli, the Bible says that they went into battle. They lost 4,000 men on the first round. They go into battle this time, and the Bible says 30,000 Israelites were killed, and the ark of the covenant was captured and taken by the Philistines. It had been gone since that time. It had been gone under the entire reign of King Saul. And here is David now, the king who has been anointed and appointed to lead the children of Israel. And he feels this burden to go and retrieve the ark of God from Abinadab's house. And 2 Samuel chapter 6 chronicles for us this idea of what it means to do things God's way. Here's the first thing I want you to see if you're going to follow God's instructions. Number one, you need to know how God instructs you to live. You need to know how God instructs you to live. 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, the New Living Translation. Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. The ark of God has been in exile for several decades now. And here it is, David has a burden and passion to go get the ark of God. Uh, I told you the ark of God was captured in battle. Uh, What I didn't tell you was the repercussions of having lost the ark of God in battle. Hopni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, the high priest, ended up dying in battle. Eli knew that Hopni and Phinehas 
uh, had some uh, immoral activities going on. And so when he got word that they were killed in battle, it wasn't so shocking. But what was disheartening to him was when the messenger said to him, and the ark of God has been captured by the Philistines. The Bible says when Eli heard the news that the ark had been captured, he literally fell back, broke his neck, and died. His daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was expecting a child. She went into labor, difficult labor, because the Bible says she would soon die after childbirth. But before she died, she was informed that she had a son. And she named that son with her dying breath, Ichabod. Literally, the glory of God has departed or the glory has left. The ark of God is in the hands of the Philistines. Uh, they take it, and, and they take it to their most holy place, and they set the ark up in a posture of worship to their God, the image of their God. The next day they came back, and the image of the Philistine God had fallen on the floor, face down in front of the ark of God. They went back, set up the false image again and came back the next day and, and found that the, the head and the arms of that false god, that, that the false god was not only on the floor, but it had been dismembered. And it was the Philistines who said, okay, you know what? There's something special about this thing. We need to get this thing out of here. And so they put it on a new cart, connected it to two oxen, pointed those oxen back to the children of Israel, gave the Yah sign, the giddy up sign, and those oxen took the ark of God back to the house of Abinadab, and that's where it remained. Now, here's what's interesting. There were specific instructions given by God as to how the ark was to be handled. Look at Exodus chapter 25, beginning at verse 12. Cast four gold rings and attach them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. These carrying poles must stay inside the rings, never remove them. So these poles were the means by which the ark was to be carried, the means by which the ark was to be handled, and the means by which the ark was to be moved. Look at Numbers chapter 3, beginning at verse 30. The leader of the Kohathite clans was Elisaphan, son of Uziel. These four clans were responsible for the care of the ark the table, the lampstand, the altars, the various articles used in the sanctuary, the inner curtain, and all the equipment related to their use. Go down to Numbers chapter 7, if you will, verse 9. But he gave none of the wagons or oxen to the Kothathite division since they were required to carry the sacred objects of the tabernacle on their shoulders. So God gives them a command. He gives them a command on how the ark is to be built, and he gives them a command on how the ark is to be transported. It is to be carried. As a matter of fact, verse 9 in the book of Numbers chapter 7 says, the Kohathite division was not given wagons or oxen, so that everything that was holy in the temple, that it would be carried by those who were responsible for the temple. There wasn't a quote-unquote easier way to handle the objects that were needed and necessary to worship God. Now, here's the point. God had instructions. And these instructions were not suggestions. They were commands. And God expected those instructions to be fulfilled. God was looking for his requirements to be met with obedience. 
Here's what I want to know from you. Is it hard to do what's correct when God has told you what to do? Maybe I should put it this way. How hard is it for you to obey what God says when you know what God has said? Let me give you an example. It's amazing when I talk to some people, and, and they're not really Christians. They're not committed Christ followers. Um, they're really doubters. They're really skeptics. But they start talking about, for example, well, I don't understand the book of Revelation. Using that as an excuse to not be a Christian. You know, uh, there seem to be some contradictory things in the Bible you know, uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I'm thinking, yeah, but there's so much in the Bible that's not even up for interpretation. Like, are you doing the things you know you need to do? Like, love ye one another, pray for one another, encourage one another. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal, right? Right? Thou shalt not bear false way. I mean, listen, you don't need any great exegetical skills to figure out those simple commands. God laid out how the children of Israel were to handle the ark of God, and I've got news for you. God has laid out some instructions in terms of how he wants you to live your life. And you have to learn how to follow God's instructions first you got to know how God instructs you to live. What has God said? Stop, listen, stop looking at what God says and then trying to change what God says to fit how you want to live. Start changing how you are going to live based on what God has said. Here's the second thing. Number two, you need to do what God commands no matter how you feel. You need to do what God commands no matter how you feel. Verse 3, 2 Samuel chapter 6, they placed the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart as it left the house, carrying the ark of God, a heel walked in front of the ark. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. They placed the ark of God on a new cart, and they were bringing it from Abinadab's house. Now, wait a minute. I just told you that in the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers, there were clear instructions from God how the ark was to be handled and how the ark was to be moved and it was very explicit in saying that it was not to be moved using a new cart because God did not provide the Kohathites with a, ark, a cart for the ark. They had to carry it. So why would they get a new cart? Well, here's what's interesting. The Bible says that the ark was sent back to them by the Philistines on a new cart. And the children of Israel, under David's leadership, had to make a decision. They had to make a decision. Whether they were conscious of it or not, they had to make a decision. Were they going to follow God's instructions or were they going to do something else? Let me give you three things that we typically do, and they're somewhat related to what we see in this text in terms of how we choose to do counter to what God says. Look at A, don't use your ignorance as an excuse to disobey God. Don't use your ignorance as an excuse to disobey God. Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, the camp will be ready to move when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the sacred articles. The Kohathites will come and carry these things to the next destination but they must not touch the sacred objects or they will die. So these are the things from the tabernacle that the Kothathites must carry. So they were told to carry the ark of God via the poles, right? They were told not to touch the ark, 
and they were told not to put it on a cart. Now, some may say, well, maybe David didn't know. After all, David would not have had a copy of the Bible like we have. And after the debacle that took place in the battle with the Philistines and the devastating uh, effects of the Philistine army coming in on what happened at Shiloh and the number of priests that were lost in that battle, maybe there weren't a lot of people who remembered what God said. But here's what's important. Ignorance was no excuse for disobedience. Ignorance was no excuse for disobedience. And my brothers and sisters, listen, you have no excuse for not following God's instructions for your life. Boy, let me put a cord in the meter park right here. Listen, you've got 24-hour Christian television, Christian radio. You've got sermons. You've got sermonettes. You, you've got the Bible uh, uh, in print. You have the Bible uh, on CD. You have the Bible you can download, Kindle. Uh, you, you have Audible Bible. I mean, you can read, study, or hear the Bible 24 hours a day. You have no excuse. You cannot claim ignorance when it comes to failing God's instructions. But here's the second thing. B, don't use your imitation of others as an excuse to disobey God. <laughs> don't use your imitation of others as an excuse to disobey God. Watch this. The Philistines sent it on a new cart. Now, remember, it rested at Abinadab's house for several decades. So, here comes David, and he's saying, hey, if it came from the Philistines on a new cart, we should be able to transport it on a new cart. That's how we got it, so let's get a new cart, and that's how we'll transport it. But here's what David needed to understand imitating the actions of the Philistines might have been in agreement with what the Philistines did, but it was still disobedient to what God said. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 10. The men did so and took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of the Lord on a cart and the box with the golden mice and the images of their tumors, and the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left as the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. So the Philistines had experienced some repercussions some maladies because of the ark of God. They wanted to get the ark of God out of there as soon as possible. They put it on a cart. But just because the Philistines did it didn't mean David had a right to do it. Listen to me carefully. Don't use imitating others to justify your disobedience. Don't sit there and say, well, I saw somebody else getting away with it. Well, they did it. So why can't I do it? Let me see if I can give you an example. Uh, so uh, two of my best friends growing up in the Jacob Reese housing projects on the Lower East Side of Manhattan was Raynard, Rembert, and Tony Calhoun. Mark Anthony Calhoun, we called him Tony, right? And so uh, Raynard and Tony and I, man, I mean, we were, we were ace boon coon. We spent a night at each other's house, right? And my, my mom was real funny. She didn't let me spend a night at a lot of people's houses. But Raynard and Tony, they, they were like, their moms were like best friend with my mom. And, and so we would always hang out together. And I can recall we, we got into some trouble, uh, not nothing real major, but it was enough that it perturbed my mother. And so I got in trouble for what happened. I got in trouble. And, uh, and, and Raynard and Tony didn't get in trouble at their house. But I got in trouble at my house. And so as I'm getting ready to get in trouble, 
I say, but Reynard was there and Tony was there and they didn't get in trouble. We all did the same thing. They didn't get in trouble. And my mother let me know that neither Reynard nor Tony belonged to her. I belonged to her. And then I got this talk. Tell me if you ever got this talk. So if Reynard jumped off a building, you going to jump off a building? If Tony runs in front of a bus, you going to run in front of a bus? In other words, if they do something stupid, you going to imitate them? Or do you have enough sense to think on your own? Um, that was a lesson that was not only seared into my conscience, but I felt it on my behind as well. Here's the point I'm making. You can't use imitating somebody else as an excuse for disobedience to God. Don't look at what somebody else is doing and think, well, if they're getting away with it, I should get away with it. God says, no, you're my child. I have a personal relationship with you. And when you know better, I expect you to do better, regardless of what somebody else does. Let me share with you C. I, I told you, be, be careful. Don't, don't allow ignorance to, to be the foundation of your disobedience. Don't allow imitation of somebody else. Here's C. Don't use your inconvenience as an excuse to disobey God. Don't use your inconvenience as an excuse to disobey God. Come on now. Think about it. It's, it's 10 plus miles from Abinadab's house to Jerusalem. This is not highway miles. This is not even side street miles, right? You, you going over rugged terrain. You going down the hill and through the valley and up the hill. I mean, you, you may be on a pathway, but this, this is not paved roads, right? Uh, you, you going through some tough terrain. It would be easier to put it on a cart than to have people carrying the ark. Why carry it when we can cart it? If the goal is to get the ark of God back to Jerusalem, what matters how we get it back to the ark, uh, get it back to Jerusalem as long as we get it there? In other words, if the end is to get the ark of God back to Jerusalem, any means should justify the end. As long as we get the ark back to God, get it back to Jerusalem, we should be good. Let me say something to you. The challenge for the Christian is to recognize that obedience to God is the prerequisite even when that obedience causes inconvenience. See, it's never about whether it's convenient or not. Don't use is it easy or hard to determine whether or not you're going to obey God. Somebody you're watching right now, you say, well, it's hard. It must not be God. No, because it's hard doesn't mean it's God. And because it's easy doesn't mean it's God. Because God said it means it's God. And when God says it, you have to obey it. Let me give you an example. When I got to Good Hope, um, we were, like many churches, a fundraising church, and we would um, have annual days and, and sell dinners. And the church had not been taught at that point uh, tithing and offerings and grace giving or none of those biblical principles of managing our, our time, talent, or our treasure. And so I began teaching those things from the Bible and I had a lady who came to me, sweet lady, loved me to death. I loved her. But she came to me. She said, Pastor, you got to explain something to me. She said, if my tithes are, for example, $10, and I take my $10 that I would tithe with, and I buy $10 worth of chicken, and I sell those chicken dinners for $20, and I take my 10 out that I put in, and I give God 10 what difference does it make to God? Because he still got $10 in the end. 
And I had to remind her of 2 Samuel 24 when David went to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and the gentleman at the threshing floor was so excited, uh, Arauna was so excited that David would come to offer a sacrifice that he said, basically, King, you don't have to pay for anything. Uh, I, I'm going to give you the sacrifice. I'm going to give you the wood. I'm going to give you my threshing floor. You don't have to pay for anything. You, all you got to do is just come. And David said, I can't do that. David said, I can't offer something to God that costs me nothing. And I had to remind that lady that we can't worship on the cheap. If we don't recognize what has come from God and we don't recognize what belongs to God, then we can't present back to God that which is holy to God. You know what? I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. I know some of y'all are like, wait a minute, Pastor, come on, come on. Now, I, I don't have time, y'all. I don't have time. I don't want to rush through this. I don't want to rush through this. We'll pick it up right here next time. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Um, thank you, God, for your word. Help us, God, as we look at our lives and we can see the times when we've used ignorance, uh, imitation, and inconvenience, when we use those things as excuses for not doing what you told us to do. And I just pray now, God, that by the Holy Spirit, you would allow each person under the sound of my voice to be reminded of those places, those times, those situations, those circumstances, including what we're dealing with right now. I pray, God, that you will uh, bless in a powerful way so that we would make the changes we need to make in our lives, both in our actions and in our attitude, in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. We ask you to bless as only you can. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who are watching today, thank you once again for the privilege of your time. My prayer is that God has spoken to you today in a very personal way to encourage you to know that it's never too late to make a change in your life. It's never too late to start doing the right thing no matter how long you've been trying to justify the wrong thing. Um, if you're watching today and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to do that, and you can do that by going online, either to our website or our app, and click on the button that says, I want to accept Christ, but how? And I will literally, by video, lead you through the prayer of salvation to ask Jesus Christ into your life. If you've already accepted Christ and you want to know what do I do now, then you click the button that says, I just accepted Christ, now what? And there are five things that we would encourage you to do as a new Christian, especially in this age of pandemic. Um, if you're looking for a church home and you believe being part of this church is where God is leading you, you're not here to make me a big preacher or to make us a big church. We're here to make you a big Christian, to help you be the best Christian you could possibly be. We would love to help you on that journey. And so if you'd like information on that, click on that button as well. I want to thank all of you for support of the ministry. Uh, throughout this broadcast, you have seen scrolling in the lower thirds way to, ways to worship the Lord in giving. There are seven ways that you can give here to the Good Hope Church. 
Um, and whether you choose to use Givelify or Apple Pay or Cash App uh, or Give Online, whatever it is, uh, we want you to know that we take your giving seriously. Uh, we honor what God gives through you, and our pledge and commitment is to use what you give to help further the kingdom work of Jesus Christ. For our members, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your giving. For our visitors who have been partnering with us, we praise God for you. For those of you who are sharing with us for the first time, if you feel so led, God bless you. I want to thank all of our volunteers uh, who have been serving. Um, we've done a tremendous job in blessing people through our food pantry, uh, through our assistance programs, getting information to people, uh, our safe space uh, educational initiatives, our work with 8 Million Stories on campus, uh, helping at-risk young men and young women. All of those things are made possible because of your faithful giving. So thank you for all that you have done. Last but not least, if you'd like to sign up for a small group, even though we are shifting out of the Joy Campaign and we're now going to be in doing it God's way for the next several weeks, I want to encourage you to sign up for a life group. Uh, life group, life is an acronym. It stands for living in fellowship every day. And even though you can't physically be in the proximity of people as we were prior to COVID, you still have an opportunity through the digital platform to be able to interact with one another. Take advantage of that. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. And do all that God has given you the opportunity to do so that we can encourage each other in our walk with God. All right? Listen, last thing, don't forget, God is doing something wonderful in me and God is doing something wonderful in you. So let's sing it together as we get ready to go. God bless you and God keep you. And Lord says the same. We'll see you next week. Listen, keep me in your prayers. Keep me in your prayers. I forgot to tell you, you know what? I had a fall. So that's why I'm kind of sitting right now. You may be wondering, you say, man, Pastor, you're looking really kind of short. Uh, you usually standing over the podium, had a fall, tore a muscle in my leg, had to have surgery. So I'll be on the men for the next couple of months. So please keep me in prayer. And listen, if you don't pray for anybody else, pray for my wife because she needs prayer because she is having to take care of me in the midst of all of this. All right? God bless you and God be with you is my prayer. Remember, God is doing something wonderful in you.